All right. Uh, good afternoon. We'll, we'll get started now. On the eve of its launch, the Secretary General today welcomed the unique opportunity provided by the Syrian-owned and Syrian-led Constitutional Committee that will be inaugurated tomorrow in Geneva with the UN's facilitation. For the first time, the government of the Syrian Arab Republic and the opposition Syrian Negotiations Commission, along with civil society, will sit together and take the first step on the political path out of the tragedy of the Syrian conflict. The Secretary General is pleased that women's representation on the commitment on the committee is very near 30 percent. The UN has been steadfast to secure that minimum threshold. He fully expects that the parties will work together in good faith toward a solution in line with Resolution 2254 that means the legitimate aspirations of all Syrians and is based on a strong commitment to the country's sovereignty, independence, unity, and territorial integrity. The Constitutional Committee's launch and work must be accompanied by concrete actions to build trust and confidence. Meaningful engagement in the Constitutional Committee, accompanied by cessation of hostilities across the country, will provide the Special Envoy, Garrett Peterson, with an environment he requires to effectively discharge his mandate to facilitate a broader political process. The Special Envoy for Syria, Garrett Peterson, is holding meetings today in Geneva with the two co-chairs and preparatory meetings separately with the committee members from the government, the Syrian Negotiations Commission, and the Middle Third members. The Special Envoy is also meeting with the foreign ministers of the Russian Federation, Turkey, and Iran as part of the series of meetings he's been holding with international stakeholders prior to the launch of the Constitutional Committee. And also on Syria, the World Food Program says that it has so far provided emergency food assistance to more than 300,000 people in Syria following the recent military operations in the Northeast. Displaced people and families who are providing shelter to the displaced are among those being assisted. WFP is also scaling up food assistance to reach as many as 58,000 vulnerable people in Hasaka and Raqqa governorates, including many of those who were recently uprooted. And the Secretary General was deeply saddened by the death of Sadika Ogata, former United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Humanitarian, and Role Model for People Across the World. Sadika Ogata set the standard for helping refugees, principled, compassionate, effective. She was fearless in her advocacy for people, humanitarian action, and political solutions. As the first woman to serve as High Commissioner for Refugees, she was a pioneer in highlighting not only the impact of violence on women, but the imperative of women's involvement in solutions. Her contributions continued long after her service as High Commissioner, in particular in arc articulating the concept of human security. Sadaka Ogata left a unique legacy and imprint on the UN Refugee Agency as the Secretary General witnessed upon assuming leadership of UNHCR a few years later. Many millions of people enjoy better lives and opportunities thanks to her solidarity and skillful work on their behalf. And the many people today who have been forcibly di displaced from their countries and homes are better served because of her achievements. The Secretary General is grateful to have known Sadako Gatta as both colleague and friend, and he offers condolences to her family, to the people and government of Japan, and to her many admirers around the world. On Thursday, the Secretary General will be in Istanbul, where he will meet with President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. While in Istanbul, the Secretary General will attend a meeting of his high-level advisory board on mediation and will address the Istanbul Mediation Conference. He will also visit the UN Technology Bank for the least developed countries, which was established to support the capacity of these countries to build their science, technology, and innovation, to transform their economies, eradicate poverty, and foster sustainable development. On Saturday, he will depart for Bangkok, where he will be delivering remarks at the opening of the 10th ASEAN-UN Summit. ASEAN has shown the value of regional integration and shared approaches to local and global challenges. And the close cooperation between regional organizations and the United Nations remains more critical than ever. While in Bangkok, the Secretary General will also participate in the launch of the ASEAN Center for Sustainable Development Studies and dialogue by the Thailand Prime Minister, Prayut Chan Ocha. He will also meet with regional leaders on the sidelines of the summit. He's expected back in New York on Monday. The Secretary General has taken note of the resignation of Prime Minister Saad Hariri of Lebanon. He calls on all sides to maintain peace and avoid violence and for security forces to show restraint and to protect civilians, including peaceful protesters. We hope that a political solution would be found to preserve stability and peace in the country. In light of today's developments, the UN Special Coordinator for Lebanon, Jan Kubish, urges the security forces to maintain law and order, 
to take action against those that instigate violence, regardless of their party affiliation, and to protect demonstrating civilians who need to maintain the peaceful character of their protests. He reminds the political parties that they bear the full responsibility for the behavior and action of their supporters and for controlling them, especially if they provoke clashes with peaceful protesters or security forces. The special representative of the Secretary General for Iraq, Janine hennis Blechert, condemns in the strongest terms the rising number of deaths and injuries during the demonstrations engulfing many parts of Iraq. The recent developments across many parts of Iraq, in particular in Karbala last night, are most alarming. Witness reports indicate that live fire was used against demonstrators, causing high numbers of casualties. Violence is never the answer. The protection of life is the overriding imperative, the special representative said. A national dialogue is urgently needed to find prompt, meaningful responses. This vicious cycle of violence must end. The UN stands with the Iraqi people and is ready to assist in this dialogue, Ms. Hennish Bleichert said. Turning to Central America, subsistence farmers and some large-scale farming operations located in an area called the Dry Corridor have lost as much as 50 to 75 percent of their crops because of irregular weather conditions, including high temperatures, below average rain, and long dry spells. Our humanitarian colleagues are concerned that these significant losses may severely affect people's access to food and increase the risk of malnutrition. The region had a severe drought last year, and as a result, it is the second year in a row that farmers experience poor first-season harvests. Last year's drought led to the loss of 280,000 hectares of bean and maize in El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua, and affected food security for more than 2 million people. The Security Council is holding an open meeting today on the theme Women, Peace, and Security. In his remarks, the Secretary General said that in the nearly two decades since the landmark Resolution 1325 was adopted, women still face exclusion from so many peace and political processes. He noted that peace agreements are still adopted without provisions considering the needs and priorities of women and girls. The Secretary General also pointed out that there is a growing number of armed groups for whom gender inequality is a strategic objective and misogyny part of their core ideology. But despite this grim litany, he said we will not give up, stressing that this is an absolute priority for him. Also speaking the, at the meeting was Fumzile Mlambo Nguka, the executive director of UN Women, who stressed the importance of political will to demand women's direct and meaningful participation in peace talks. Both sets of remarks have been shared with you, and Ambassador Mona Jewell, the president of ECOSOC, also issued a statement. And we have an update on Haiti, where widespread protests in the past six weeks have limited the ability of our UN and humanitarian partners to deliver assistance to thousands of the most vulnerable Haitians. The humanitarian community urges all parties to facilitate access to everyone affected by the crisis so that they can receive the assistance they need. Despite the worrying security context, in recent days, the UN and humanitarian partners have delivered a one-month supply of fuel, drugs, medical supplies, and oxygen tanks to 17 hospitals, providing health care to over 4.3 million people. The fuel delivered will allow pumping stations to, dis to distribute drinking water to more than 400,000 people. The International Solidarity Conference on the Venezuelan Refugee and Migrant Crisis, held in Brussels yesterday and today, sent a strong message of support to the Venezuelan refugees and migrants, as well as to their host countries and communities in Latin America and the Caribbean. The conference was co-chaired by the European Union, UNHCR, and IOM. It reviewed best practices and achievements of host countries, confirmed international support for a regional and coordinated response, and called for a global and inclusive partnership where solidarity and responsibility are shouldered by the entire international community, but are also shared between public and private sectors. More information on the outcomes of this conference is available on online. I have a personnel appointment. Today, the Secretary General is appointing Ms. Damalola Ogunbi of Nigeria as a special representative for Sustainable Energy for All and co-chair of United Nations Energy. The Secretary General also welcomes the announcement by the Administrative Board of Sustainable Energy for All that Ms. Ogunbi has been appointed Chief Executive Officer of Sustainable Energy for All. Ms. Ogunbi su succeeds Rachel Kite of the United Kingdom, and the Secretary General expresses his gratitude to Ms. Kite for her dedication and commitment to the United Nations, her achievements in accelerating universal energy access, and her leadership in advancing sustainable energy transition in the context of the Paris Agreement. Ms. Ogunbi brings extensive leadership experience and, tra and a track record of supporting energy access in sub-Saharan Africa to these roles. She was the first 
woman to be appointed as managing director of the Nigerian Rural Electrification Agency, and we have her bio. And for uh, the budget, our thanks today go to Honduras, which has paid its regular budget dues in full. The total number of fully paid up member states is now 134. And tomorrow, at 10 a.m. in the ECOSOC chamber, there will be an event to observe the 10th anniversary of the Mandate on Sexual Violence and Conflict created by, the Secu by Security Council Resolution 1888. This event aims to provide a critical opportunity to take stock of progress, challenges, and change, and to set the stage for the next decade of concerted efforts to end conflict-related sexual violence. Survivors of conflict-related sexual violence will also share their stories in the form of a survivor's hearing. Also tomorrow at 1 p.m. in the Security Council stakeout, uh, the, the Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence and Con Conflict, Pramila Patton, the Minister of International Relations and Cooperation of South Africa, Naledi Pandor, and 2018 Nobel Peace Prize laureates Nadia Murad and Dennis Mukwege will brief the media. Following my briefing at 12.30, there will be a briefing here by Arthur Erkin, Director of Communications and Strategic Partnerships of the UN Population Fund. He will discuss the upcoming Nairobi Summit on the International Conference on Population and Development, which is scheduled to take place in Nairobi, Kenya from the 12th to the 14th of November. And tomorrow at 12.30 p.m., there will be a briefing here by E. Tendai Achiume, Special Rapporteur on Contemporary Forms of Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance. Are there any questions for me? Yes, Ali. Thank you, Farhan. Uh, today we have uh, witnessed uh, attacks uh, by thugs from uh, Hezbollah and Amal movement uh, against the peaceful protesters in downtown Beirut, uh, attacking also journalists. And um, I wonder whether you have anything to say about the, uh, those attacks, uh, violent attacks, uh, against the peaceful protesters and against the uh, journalist, uh, and I have a follow-up. Well, uh, on this, uh, uh, as you know, both the Secretary General and Mr. Kubish have made clear the need uh, to protect civilians, including the protection of peaceful protesters. Uh, they both emphasized this, and uh, Mr. Kubish made uh, clear, uh, as, I, as I pointed out, he has reminded the political parties that they bear the responsibility for the behavior and action of their supporters and for controlling them especially if they provoke clashes with peaceful protesters or security forces. But uh, can I follow up? Why, why, why aren't you addressing those thugs uh, condemning or express uh, how the Secretary General and the United Nations um, is reacting to those attacks? Well, uh, again, uh, I've made it clear we're, we're fully opposed and strongly opposed to all attacks that, that impede uh, the peaceful protests that are underway. This is something the Secretary General has made clear, and as you know, he has uh, pointed out in recent weeks uh, the need to protect peaceful protesters uh, in many countries in the world, including in Lebanon, as he has also specifically mentioned. So we have done that, and, uh, as, and as, uh, Mr. Cooper has made clear, uh, the, the political parties who will bear full responsibility for what their supporters are doing, including uh, these, uh, including any such attacks. Yes, Sylvia. Uh, follow up, please. Uh, follow no, up. No, she, uh, she also has a question on Lebanon. Yes. Uh, thank you, Farhan. Uh, any any reaction from the SG on the resignation of uh, Prime Minister Hariri? Um, you, you may have missed this, but I mentioned at the start that uh, both uh, uh, the Secretary General and uh, Mr. Kubish had, had reacted. Uh, and uh, again, uh, one thing I would like to reiterate is the Secretary General calls on all sides to maintain peace and avoid violence and for security forces to show restraint and to protect civilians, including peaceful protesters. We hope that a political solution would be found to preserve stability and peace in the country. Uh, just yes. another follow-up. Now that the, uh, Mr. Hariri has submitted his resignation to the uh, President of the Republic, uh, what, in the view of the United Nations, what does Lebanon need? What kind of government at this point? Well, I... I don't want to weigh in this uh, uh, right now. This is, of course, a sovereign process of the government of Lebanon. Our hope is that all the political forces in the country will continue to come together and ensure that peace and stability is maintained in Lebanon. 
uh, as for the the resignation, I, I believe the the process now goes uh, to the presidency to determine uh, the the follow up steps. Uh, yes. Thanks, Farhan. Regarding the budget, how much more money has come in since you said recently that there was now enough money to pay the staff? Well. Uh, I'm aware that different countries have, have done various different partial payments. I believe that uh, in recent weeks we've received uh, to the tune of $200 million, and that helps us uh, to continue with uh, the payroll for the coming month. Uh, and we do have expectations of, uh, of further partial payments uh, coming uh, in the next uh, few weeks. So, uh, so that is a good sign, although uh, we continue... Uh, to be uh, in the red uh, financially, so we so we are still uh, uh, having to make sure that uh, we can maintain all of our budgetary commitments. But we are in touch, uh, as as you're aware. There are a number of uh, key nations, about seven nations, that uh, are accountable for uh, the vast majority, about 97 percent of the dues we continue to be owed, and we are in regular contact with them. Uh, they have been uh, uh, very helpful about trying to uh, uh, proceed with, uh, with payments in accordance with their own uh, budgetary cycles, and we'll see where we go with that. Uh, yes, again, Sylviane? And then you. Uh, no, Sylviane first, and then you. Uh, is, is there any, regarding the, the demonstration in Lebanon, on the... 13 days or 14 days now. Is there any plan for the United Nations to step in to help in or to facilitate the situation? It seems nothing, we're not going anywhere. Well, we will provide whatever role the, 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 the government and, and, the, and the parties would want us to play. Uh, Mr. Kubish is in touch with many of the different uh, uh, main uh, uh, players on the ground. And he is working with them to make sure that uh, that uh, they will continue to maintain the stability that the country has enjoyed. Yes, please. Yes. The Jews. Uh, well, uh, off the top of my head, they they include uh, the the United States, uh, Brazil, uh, Venezuela, uh, Iran, uh, Argentina, Mexico. Um, there's, there's one I'm forgetting. But, um, but uh, in any case, we are in contact with the countries, and, uh, and they are uh, continuing uh, to provide partial payments. Several of them have provided partial payments in recent weeks, and, and we are hopeful for a continuation of that. Yes, please, Tarek. Thank you, uh, Farhan. Uh, follow up on the budget uh, question. Uh, since Venezuela, Iran uh, have already uh, sanctions in place, how does the payment or the transfer of funds goes from these countries where they have restrictions on sending money abroad goes to the United Nations? The second question uh, is... If I could answer your first sure. question before we go to the second one. Uh, on this, yes, there are series, there are alternative arrangements that need to be made for the countries that are facing sanctions, and we are in touch with them to make sure that there are, in fact, alternative ways of making, uh, making sure that their, their payments can go through. Uh, the second question is about the escalators. Uh, when, when are they going to open the door at least so we can bypass uh, the, the long uh, going around the, 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 the Cape to go to our offices in the press corps on yeah. the third and fourth floor? Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, our security colleagues inform us that for security reasons, when the elevators are turned off, they cannot be used as stairs. So we'll have to wait for a point where we can once more turn them back on. Uh, yes, uh, Linda. Thank you, Farhan. Continuing on the budget saga, you mentioned that um, there are about seven key countries that will be paying about 97% of whatever is due, which means that there are about a quarter of the membership owes about 3%. So I was just wondering, um, I believe that th what makes this year different is that so many more countries, not the big ones, in general small countries are, are late. What kind of communication has there been with these small countries, and have they given any explanation in terms of why they're not paying and when they will? Uh, yes, we're, we're in touch with the smaller countries as well, and their payments are helpful too. I, I just announced uh, one uh, mere minutes ago from Honduras, which 
which paid uh, $50,000, which is uh, their full payment for the year and is appreciated. But, uh, but it's a small step on the way towards helping us. Uh, so we are in communications with them. And of course, for, for many of them, these are countries from the devel developing world. So it's clear that sometimes there are problems w uh, in terms of getting payments from them. But, uh, but uh, we do press them as well to make sure that they keep up with their commitments. Carla? Thank you. Uh, Farhan, is it seven countries or 64 countries? Last time I asked uh, Stefan for four, the names of four countries which he had mentioned. He had mentioned three. And then on my way out, one of my colleagues said to me, no, there was a list release that there were 64 countries who had not paid. There are 64 so countries that have not paid. Uh, my point is that 97% of those arrears are from a, a small number of larger countries, but there's 64 countries. Now, with one new payment, there's 63. So, so our number has decreased. Yes. Thank you, Juan. Uh, about the death of the Sadako uh, Ogata, uh, like you said, uh, as you know, that yeah, just after she became the High Commissioner, uh, she directed to uh, support not only the refugee, but also the IDP, uh, Kurdish people inside the Iraq. Mm -hmm. So does the Secretary General's comment accord Sadako Ogata set the standard for helping refugees uh, imply that, that her, her that action? What? I, I'm sorry? So the, the statement uh, said that Sadako Ogata set the standard mm -hmm. for helping refugees uh, what does that imply? I wonder if that the, uh, she just became uh, the uh, high commissioner. She enlarged the scope of the yes. support to uh, not only to yes. the refugee outside the country, but also IDP people. Yeah. Yes, and, and, and uh, the Secretary General wants to reflect that. One of the things he pointed out was the many people today who've been forcibly displaced from their countries and homes are better served because of her achievements. And that, that of course, means people who are internally displaced as well as those who are externally displaced. Thanks, and I'll now get our guest.